The Cavs went 1-3 and three this past week. Let's get right into it starting last Wednesday at Memphis. They lost 115-114 to against the Grizzlies. This was a very close one. Uh, no Donovan Mitchell for this one and for a lot of the games this week. I'm bringing that, that up not as an excuse for losing, uh, just to kind of give these, give these games a bit of the context that they're, you know, arguably their most dynamic scorer. I know Darius Garland might have something to say about that, but by and large, their most dynamic scorer uh, is out, and that means someone has to step up. Again, not an excuse for losing, just kind of a bit of a of a, of a context build there where someone has to step up for Donovan Mitchell not being in the lineup. Uh, Karis LeVert starting at the two spot, and I thought he played pretty well. Uh, this was a really fun game in general, despite the bad result for the Cavs and some of the uh, late game shenanigans. Just as an objective viewer, this was a really fun game to watch. Uh, the Cavs had the upper hand early, but Grizzlies uh, did even things up before the second quarter. Then Memphis took a commanding lead in that quarter after the Cavs went pretty cold, uh, but the Cavs made it into a manageable distance by halftime, and you could tell that Darius Garland uh, was going to be the one stepping up in this game, like I mentioned earlier, with the absence of Donovan Mitchell. Uh, the Cavs gradually catching up in the third quarter, and then the fourth quarter was just a neck-and-neck -neck dogfight the whole way through, both teams going back and forth with the lead. Uh, Darius Garland having a lot to do with that. He was phenomenal in this game. Uh, and then you get down to the final minute of the fourth quarter. It's it's the nitty gritty time, and you have the inbounds pass. You have about you know three seconds left on the shot clock, and you're behind your own basket. So it's definitely well behind the basket you're trying to score in. So it's definitely possible to score here. And even then, you do have a timeout in your back pocket. Uh, but somehow this inbounds pass results in a five second violation. Again, you're up by one. You have a timeout. You could this could that. That five-second violation could have been avoided should, you know, one of the, you know, J.B. Bickerstaff chosen to call the timeout, but uh, he didn't. The, the ball went over to Memphis. Steven Adams gets an offensive rebound tip-in to, to put the Grizzlies up by one, and the final Cavs possession was pretty much a mess, and if I'm remembering correctly, they did not call a timeout uh, in that final possession as well. Uh, you know, th this still was a great game, but the ending just left a, a really bad taste in my mouth. And I, I feel like a lot of Cavs fans uh, had a very similar reaction to, to the ending of that one where you did have the lead and it just kind of felt like you just kind of gave the game away to, the, to Memphis with the inbounds pass where you get a five second violation. Maybe, you know, if you call that last time out and it's still a five second violation, then just hats off to the to the Grizzlies, you know, inbound pass defense. But to, to have that timeout and choose not to use it is a bit of a head scratcher to me. Uh, that leads us to Friday at back at home against Golden State where they lost 120-114. to 114. Uh, and This was the most embarrassing loss of the week, uh, in my opinion. Still no Donovan Mitchell for the Cavs, but that should not have mattered at all because the Warriors were resting uh, pretty much all of their guys that you think of when you think of who the Warriors should be playing. Uh, Steph, Clay, Draymond Green, Wiggins, all of those are out. I know the Warriors have uh, other skilled players, obviously, uh, but when those four guys are resting, you should feel pretty good about your chances. And I don't really feel like I need to analyze this game a whole lot deeper than that the Cavs uh, lost to the Warriors bench. And the final score actually makes it look like it was a lot closer than it was. Uh, a lot of that, that six-point deficit was the Cavs playing catch-up. Uh, the Warriors just pretty much uh, ran the show the whole way in Cleveland. Uh, that was kind of a rough... A rough time for them. Uh, you could look at the shooting numbers for Golden State and say that, you know, hey, the, the Warriors, they just had a really good shooting night. And I guess you'd be right, guys like Jordan Poole and, and you know, Dante DaVinci or whatever his name is. Uh, they, they went off for some pretty good for some pretty good shooting nights in the cap you know the caps i wish they did but the warriors shooting uh more than 50 percent from three-point land yeah sure you can say that the cat the you know warriors just got lucky or or maybe not even lucky but the Cavs just kind of got the uh short end of the stick on having a, a bad shooting night and the warriors going off but a lot of those outside shots weren't really that contested or were contested late uh, the per perimeter defense for the Cavs has maybe become a little bit of a concern. I'm not panicked about it yet. Uh, honestly, the defense in general I still think is pretty good. I'm more concerned about stuff like uh, the offense seemingly being one piece going missing away from becoming dysfunctional or some of the rotational decisions seem to be not adding up. But overall, the defense, I think it's okay. But the perimeter defense does have its nights every now and again. Uh, there are guys on the Cavs that did have good games against the Warriors. Garland hitting 30 points again. 
Uh, but once that, that loss is still awful. I don't, you know, any amount of silver linings in that loss is just kind of some copium at that point. Uh, then you get to Saturday, back to back, uh, still at home against Milwaukee. They got the W in this one, 114 to 102. Uh, another team that's missing some of their star players, uh, Milwaukee, missing Giannis and Middleton. Uh, so another team playing without their stars. Dean Wade returned to the lineup for the Cavs in this one. He's been out for a while. Uh, this game was just an Evan Mobley masterclass. He finished with 38 points on a 19 for 27 shooting. He went, he was crazy. Uh, game was, however, scarily competitive for most of this one. I was f thinking that maybe the Cavs would lose back-to-back uh, -back games against teams that, you know, they, they're missing a bunch of key players and they shouldn't be losing to. Uh, Drew Holiday and Bobby Portis giving the Cavs some trouble throughout the contest. Uh, the Cavs did eventually break away in the fourth quarter, led by Evan Mobley. And then once they broke away in that quarter, they kept the game at a pretty good distance. Uh, by the end of it, it was comfortable, but uh, the process of getting there was pretty uh, pretty rough, for at least at least me watching it. Uh, but overall, a solid win over a team missing two key players and featuring an amazing game from Evan Mobley, which is encouraging to see. Uh, and then you get to yesterday's game at the Garden against the Knicks. They lose 105-103. to Donovan Mitchell returned to the lineup in this one. So the Cavs are pretty much... Uh, not not I, I think Dylan Windler is still out. But the Cavs are pretty much fully healthy for this one. Uh, story of this game, however, was Julius Randle tying his career high of eight three-pointers made. He was having a, a nuts game. I mentioned the perimeter defense being a bit of an issue earlier. But I honestly thought the Cavs defense uh, played pretty well in this game. 105 points is a pretty decent total to, home a, to hold a team to, especially when one of their players is Julius Randle having a uh, career three-point shooting night. So I thought the defense was fine. Uh, the game, again, objectively good. This game was competitive throughout as a as a, in, in a neutral observer would have found this game to be very, very fun. Uh, I, as a Cavs fan, thought it was fun too. It's just uh, it's, it's a bit soured when you take into, the, into account the result for the Cavs. Uh, the Knicks did kind of get away from the Cavs in the second, but the... But, you know, Cleveland closed the gap in a pretty short order. And the starting lineup for the Cavs played pretty darn well. I thought, uh, you know, Mitchell, Darius Garland, and Jarrett Allen all surpassing 20 points. But it was the Cavs bench who was fairly inactive in this one. Uh, Ricky Rubio and Karis LeVert were the only bench scorers. Uh, Chetty Osman only getting three minutes in this one was a bit puzzling to me. And uh, uh, Kevin Love has become a non-option at this point. Uh, he, he's had some... It's, it's been more bad games than good ones, and the bad games are really bad. Uh, at this point, you might as well just give Diakite a go. I mean, it, you, you might as well give him some minutes. If he provides nothing to the Cavs on the floor, I don't know if it would be any worse than some of these nights we've seen from Kevin Love at this point. And it's sad to say I'm not taking any pleasure in saying that Kevin Love hasn't uh, been that good and that he should be, you know, probably his spot should be moved for, for Diakite at least for a little bit, but that, that's just the reality of where we are. Uh, the game comes down to the last Cavs possession. The Cavs down by two. Donovan Mitchell missing his contested close shot as he's driving to the paint. And Evan Mobley gets the offensive rebound, but he can't get his wild turnaround last second fade away uh, to drop in. So that's how that game ends. So some close losses for the Cavs, but uh, honestly, throughout this week, I felt like the Cavs uh, underperformed a little bit. I felt like there were some questionable coaching decisions, whether it's the, you know, like I said, Chetty Osman getting three minutes against the Knicks or that. Uh, fiasco late against Memphis. Some of those things are starting to are really starting to creep up and add up to a season where uh, the Cavs might be teetering on the edge of kind of like pretending of being pretenders a little bit uh, because the Cavs have been pretty much hovering around 500 ever since their eight game winning streak at the very beginning of the season. Uh, so as far as the standings go, the Cavs are still fifth in the East. They are now one and a half games behind the Nets for fourth place. They were uh, neck and neck with the Nets, but now they're falling behind a little bit. Still two games ahead of the Heat in sixth, and they're three games ahead of having to be in the play-in tournament. That's definitely not something you uh, want to be in. You'd like to avoid the play-in game uh, at all costs. At least for me, I'm still scarred from last year's uh, play-in tournament experience for the Cavs, but that's just me. Uh, so thank you all for watching. you made it this far into the video. I will see you at the next one.